good morning and welcome back to the Friday edition of Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne. Disembodied hands, Quindy. No, Justin. <laughs> Justin has gone beyond. Sorry. Um, he's gone beyond being a, being a disembodied hands or a disembodied brain. He's just not here. And then there's John, who still is with us on occasion, even chats. So he gets he has higher points. And you know, I have to prioritize John now. John, it's going to be John. It's like just going to be me, Quindy, and John. Yeah, I'm going to have to prioritize. you got to upgrade you. <laughs> All right, guys. Yeah, happy Friday. Happy Friday. Disembodied beard. Yes! Yes! Disembodied beard. I need to remember that one. Good one, Quindy. Good one. Disembodied beard. Absolutely. We're going to do more leather today, so I'm going to mix up my colors. Where are you, Russet Brown? There you are. I have to do the Reaper order today because we're getting close to done with, like, two models, and I'm, like, looking at my other models, and I'm like, but... And I have to get that Bob Rodolfi model, and I have to, like, get some paint. So, hey, Slayer. Morning. Morning. It's a morning. I am amazed that I am not broken today guys. I am amazed. Last night was my, my first, you know, I was gone for six days and I went back and did my third CrossFit class. Let's just say that the rotation, and remember the rotation is three sets, three sets. The rotation opens with 50 squats, 50. I can't do 50. <laughs> I did 30. Still, it's too many. <laughs> yeah, I started CrossFit. I, um, I started jogging for a slayer. I was, I was getting this, uh, yeah, I was getting really, um, as you get older, you have to start some weights really, if you want to keep yourself fit and not fall apart as you get older. And I, I'm hitting, I hit that older, you know, that half century mark. So, um, so I was looking around for weights, but you know, it's like, I don't want to just go to a gym and have to make up my own workout. So I started all the good gyms right here around me. We're all CrossFit, CrossFit gyms. So I was like, well, what is this thing? So I looked it up and it's mostly strength training. And so I was like, all right, this sounds like, and it was high intensity impact, which I actually wanted. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I tried it out. I went to their little intro class that was free and I actually enjoyed myself. Like I used to really, in high school, I had a gym teacher who actually believed that women belonged in the weight room alongside guys, which in the eighties was like, not a common uh, encouragement, right? But he encouraged girls to get strong too. And so I really enjoyed weights when I was in high school and early college. Um, I made a point of, of going to like the gym facility for when I was in my freshman and, and sophomore year of college. Then I fell out of it. But um, yeah, even 30 squats, right? <laughs> I can do 30 though. If I pause, if I take little rests, I can do 30. Um. But yeah, so I decided to give it a try and I can always cancel. It's, a, it's an easy cancellation. They bill you monthly. You just have to let them know halfway through the month if you want, to, if you want out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but so 30 squats and then actually, and this is okay. This is the fun part of CrossFit is I get to learn to use all the things. So it was the rings, guys. You know that funky ring stuff you see them do in the Olympics? It's the only time I've ever encountered rings before. I learned... Okay, this is crazy. So you grab, you learn how to grab the rings first, which is a totally weird grip. And then you're like leaning back and you have to pull yourself up and pull the rings down under till, till the rings are right up next to your body. And you're like, you're resting on your biceps and on your shoulders. Like that's how you lock it in. That's how, and then you have to try to hang there. And then you have to try to jump up and hold yourself upright, balanced on the rings. Okay, like I could not do the last part. <laughs> I could do a little hop. <laughs> But, but just the pull and position, like my, my, all of these muscles, I'm surprised my arms aren't limp noodles today. But man, I guess, uh, uh, you know, when you have 17 years of lifting giant buckets of paint at Reaper, you actually get a fair amount of upper body. And I, I'm somehow managed to retain that a little bit of that, I guess. Yeah. Three sets of 50 is a lot, but that's what their point is. They're trying to make you stronger, right? There were some of those people who've been going for years in my class and they just, they just did it. Yeah. But yeah, I just started. So they usually, they always give me, um, 
Oh yeah, rings. So you know how hard it is, right? How difficult it is to like hold those things close to you. They just want to fly out. Yeah, so, but I was excited because because I like learning new things and I'm, ex and, I, and I'm excited to try it. So I was actually, actually pretty, pretty psyched about the rings. And then I learned how to actually lift a barbell. That was the third. There are three exercises, right? And you have to do three rounds of this crap. So the rings, there were seven, seven reps. And then the third one was a barbell lift, which was pretty much balancing it on your, just on your thighs, just above your knees and learning how to properly, properly just get it up to this position and then roll it down. Oh yeah, rings. Yeah, the rings are, they were fun. Like if I wasn't like, I need to lose a bit more weight. And I need to like work out so that I can get my real upper body back. But the rings were fun. I had fun with the rings. Much as it was difficult, I actually enjoyed learning to do that. But yeah, and then learning um, claw grip. Claw grip for the... So if you've never lifted up a barbell, you don't just do this. You actually you actually hook your, your two end fingers around it. But then you put your thumb in and you lock your fingers over your thumb. So essentially it gives you a much more secure grip. It feels really funny at first, but when you get into it, you realize that it's much more secure than trying to just hold it with these fingers if you have that lock. So yeah. Yeah. Rings. There were people doing crazy things with the rings in this class. So yeah. So it was cool. Like I learned, I learned it, it beat me. <laughs> I thought it was going to be so much sore this morning. I did take a muscle relaxer last night, so maybe that helped. But, um, but uh, yeah, it, it was, and learning proper form and everything so I don't hurt myself is important. So yeah, it was, uh, it, I was beat by the end of that. The cool thing though, is I give myself a smoothie after workouts now. I love smoothies and I drop them cause low carb, but you can make a pretty low carb smoothie with soy milk and um, fresh fruit or frozen. I like frozen cause then it gives it more of a frozen smoothie thing. But yeah, so that's, that's my reward <laughs> for going to CrossFit is I get to have my smoothie afterwards. <laughs> But yeah, I was like drenched in sweat. Like I was done. I was like, everything felt like noodly. I was feeling like, like, like the great, the giant spaghetti, great spaghetti monster with my noodly appendages. Yeah. So I'm surprised I'm not wrecked today. Like I do, I'm a little sore in my back. So if we have to get up and do stretches, we will. And I'm definitely sore all through my shoulder assembly and my biceps and tries. Um, I switched, I love coconut milk slayer. And for a long time, I just used coconut milk and stuff. Like my creamer was coconut milk and et cetera, et cetera. But I switched to soy because I wanted more plant-based protein. And I actually discovered that I like soy milk. Like I, if I have a soy milk latte, I don't have to have any sweetener in it. I actually just like the flavor. So, but yeah, I used to use, I used to use coconut water. Yep. I used to use coconut water. Yeah. That's a good one too. Agent Marvel. So yeah, coconut milk and coconut, coconut water used to be my go-tos, but then I stopped doing smoothies entirely because it was adding more calories and more carbs. And so for a long time, I just dropped smoothies, especially like after I started keto. Right. But now I'm like, I'm low carb. And as long as I stay at a level of carbs, that's like around 50 grams per day or below it, I'm good. So I can add in a smoothie if I, if I don't carb out the rest of the day. Um, so yeah, it's good. It's good. Do, 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 do. Alrighty, let's get this mixed up. But yeah, so that was my, I'm kind of amazed I'm not just destroyed today. But it's cool, like I always feel good afterwards. It's, it's, it's rough, but the cool, okay, so the really cool thing about working out like this as an adult, I was telling David this because when I was a kid, I hated it. I hated all this stuff. I liked the weight room, but like I hated like Fayette. I hated gym. I hated all this sort of thing. And the reason really when I came down to it, when I really thought about it is because as a kid, the adult tells you to do something, you have to do it. Even if it feels bad, even if you're like dying, even if, even if you're like hardly can keep your breath and they don't care about proper form and they didn't care about X, Y, or Z. It's just, you have to do it. Right. And so I hated it because I had to do it. But now as an adult, if they tell me to do something in class, I'm like, I'm paying you guys, you know, 150 bucks a month. If I don't think I can do 10 reps, I'm going to do five. Right. And, and shut up if you're going to tell me no, because <laughs> I'm the one paying you. And if it doesn't feel good after five, I'm just going to stop. Right. So, and that makes just a huge world of difference for me. Like just an immense amount of difference. Cause I know that I can one, I know I have to try hard, but if I'm trying hard and, I, and I'm at my limit, I stop. 
So I don't do those 50 squats. I do as many squats as I can do in good, with good form and then I move on. And nobody guilts me and nobody gives me crap. Right, exactly. Yeah, no, that's actually, that's why I signed up with this gym is that he's the, the owner, Tim. He's just like, the point of CrossFit for most people is not to get super ripped and crazy and do, you know, ultra marathons and, and whatever else, right? It's not, it's not what most people come to CrossFit for. Most people come to CrossFit because they want to be able to do everything they want to do in their lives. They want to be able to hike in the hills without losing their breath. They want to be able to bend over easily and pick up stuff, right? They want to be able to reach that shelf over their head and take the heavy thing down without, you know, feeling like they're off balance, right? You, that's why people do CrossFit. That's why normal people do CrossFit. There are still those crazy athletes that love it, but in general, and he understands that. And he's like, so my goal is to make it so that you can do everything functionally in your life that you want to do, even as you get older. And I'm like, sold. That's exactly what I want. That's exactly what I wanted. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, Big Chimpo. That's true for a lot of people. Yeah. Like, everybody wants to jump in and go hard, right? They think, oh, well, I can do this. And I'm just going, if anything, I started out too, too low. Like, I'm realizing now that my upper body is better than I thought. So I upped my, um, my barbell weight last night. Still haven't gotten to the point of putting actual weights on the end of the barbell, but still. <laughs> And at least I know how to grip one now, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, okay. So enough about working out. More about painting. <laughs> that was just my thing last night. So I was like, do, 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 do. Yeah. But I'm really, actually, I'm really happy that I don't feel totally wrecked by it because that means I'm, I'm getting there, right? I'm building strength, which is exciting to me. I really want to feel strong again. Like there were, there have been times in my life where I really was working out with weight, usually with weight machines, but like I felt strong, like I felt good, and I I want to feel that way again. So that's my motivator here. But yeah, it seems like um, maybe it's just the region of the country, or maybe it's just this guy. But this this CrossFit gym is really good at scaling the exercises for uh, newbies, noobs like me, old noobs. They have an over sixties class too, like um, over sixty people. So. I know that I knew that he was, that's actually one reason I decided to go there is because when you've got, when you offer a class for people who are over 60, you automatically, you know how to scale, right? When the, you understand that as you age, you can't do quite as much. I'm going to throw a brown liner in here for my shading. We're just going to mix up some brown liner, russet brown, and then a mix. Remember a mix of uh, desert sand and russet brown were what, was what we were using for the boots because it's a, it's a really good, just neutral, um, dark brown highlight that doesn't, it's muted, but it's, it's still a good, like, it's a good base level. It's not too orange. It's not too yellow. It's not too red. So when I want a true neutral brown, I tend to grab, um, either desert sand or, or, uh, driftwood brown and mix it into russet. But yeah, so I'm really, I'm enjoying my workouts. Like I always kind of dread them beforehand, but then once I get there, I'm just like, okay, cool. I try to go in with an open mind. Like I try to use my beginner brain, if you know it, the reference from Zen. But beginner's mind means you go in. And it's a good thing for painting actually too. It means you go in without trying to overthink yourself. If you have beginner's mind, you are, you're ready for everything. You acknowledge I, that I don't know anything and I'm going to go in with a positive mindset, right? And just give it a try. Um, whereas if you don't have beginner's mind, and this is where, you know, sometimes new people will do better in a class than people who already know stuff, especially like advanced people. Um, because the advanced person thinks, you know, they, they think they know a lot already, right? So they may not go into the class with a completely open mind. Um, and they don't get the value then, right, of learning because they're closed to it. So when I started CrossFit, I was like, I'm not going to judge this. I'm just going to go and do it and I'm going to just experience it and see how I feel. And I'm not going to dread it or worry that I can't do it or worry that it's too much for me or whatever. I'm just going to do it and give it a chance. Um, I did the same thing actually when I did that class with Mark Masklins, the painting class, the seminar a couple months ago. Um, when I, I feel sometimes I had felt in previous classes that I had gone in with too much, too much Anne, like too much, too much, um, uh, kind of listening to the instructor with a filter of what I already knew. 
So with Mark, I decided I'm just going to do exactly what he does. I'm going to pretend I know nothing and I'm just going to work the way he works. And I got a lot out of the class because I did it that way. So when you go into these classes, especially those you go into ReaperCon, try to try to hit that beginner's mind thing. Like no matter how much you know or think you know or know you know, kind of reset your brain and say, I'm just going to try exactly what this person shows me, even if it's not usually the way I would tackle something, right? You go into that, go into each class with that mindset, you're going to get more out of it because you're going to be open to considering ways that if you, if you let yourself get in the way, it might be, oh, I don't like that. That's not how I paint, you know, or, oh, that seems weird or, you know, anything like that. Put it out of your mind. Just do it. <laughs> Big Jimpo funny. Yeah, I always have a little dread before I go to CrossFit just because it's like, it's hard work, right? It's an hour of hard work. But I'll tell you, it flies by. I'm always astonished at how quickly we're done. All right, so here's my colors, and these are just the starters. I didn't want the brown to get too light, so I'm not going with too light with that. You can see how how adding in the desert sand, which has a lot of white in it, you can see how that makes the paint more opaque. So I'm going to uh, put in one more brush full of water here. Just to thin it down a little more. I'll probably have to do even a little more than that, but we'll see. <clears throat> but yeah, I'm not... I'm not completely like Zen, but I do read a lot. I do like Zen as a uh, philosophy and with the beginner's mind stuff, they're dead on. Like they're just dead on. Go in, just go. When you're trying to learn something, when you're taking a class, go in with no predispositions if you can. Clear your brain and just make yourself a little sponge. Pretend you know nothing. Pretend this is your first day painting ever. It also lets some of the pressure off of you, right? If you if you feel like you're kind of uh, an intermediate painter already, like you can feel kind of a pressure, like, oh, I'm not a noob anymore. This guy's not going to cut me any slack, right? But um, in reality, if you go in just, to, just like role playing that you're completely new and you've never done it before, it takes pressure off of you. You can just relax and enjoy it and try the things. Gotta flood this area a little bit more here. Got it very dark. There. Alrighty. I do have a buckle or clasp here that I have to hit too with metallics, but it's so small I'm gonna wait just till I'm the end of everything. But yeah, I mentioned before the class, I mentioned to David that I was going into that with that mindset. And he's like, oh, I should try that. And so I feel like he got a lot out of the class as well. It's good. So up around these buckles, I'm not going to do much highlighting. Just a tiny bit. Because it'll make it closer to this um, brass that we used. Oh, got a little bit muddy on that. But yeah, it's hard to view something through the lens of never having done it before when you're very familiar with the subject matter. But if you just kind of clear your brain and uh, I, the other thing I did during that class was I forced myself to work with the Chimera paints, like for the whole thing, except for, except for pure white. I refused to compromise on my pure white, but um, because I was working with a whole new paint line, I was able to kind of just focus and like really see how they differed and, and see how they worked with the techniques and that helped me to to put my own like experience aside with msp it would have been harder because i'm so familiar with that all right let's get the gloves and the pouches yeah you know we make fun of zen but it really is a cool philosophy like there are there are things like where i could never like just become an aesthetic and give up all my belongings and live with nothing but but that's like an ex that's like a like if you're going to become a monk, right? It's not not for everybody. Mostly Zen is about living more in the present, 
taking each moment as it comes without judgment and uh, and being you, like embracing the you-ness of you, which I'm all about. Like, trying to react from your true self instead of the way that people feel you should or the way that you feel you should and stuff like that. It's cool. It's cool. I like it. All right, I'm gonna just do a little bit around the edge of this bag here just to get it standing out a little bit. You can see it right there. Oh, you meant that as a serious home. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I meditate from time to time. It's not a serious practice for me. So I'm tempted to make it one. For a while there, when I was under a lot of stress during the, during the divorce, I did make it a daily practice. And it helped. It helped a lot. And then I went out here when Kiri was going downhill. I did it again. I, I was pretty much meditating after my walk every day. There was a fountain out in our courtyard and I would just go and clear my brain because otherwise the tension was too much. Like it was just too hard to watch her um, going downhill. So yeah, I do turn to it. From time to time kind of tempted to try a meditation retreat one of these days something out in nature that does like walking meditations and and sitting and uh, science has proven actually that they've done brain scans on people doing art um, and the the flow state that you get into when you're really in the zone as, uh, is almost identical to the state you get in when meditating as far as brain states go. So I had often wondered about that and lately research has been done to demonstrate a, a definite similarity between those two things. So the flow state and meditation, very, very close. So when you feel like you're in the zone, guess what? You are actually in the zone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just goes to show you, because Buddhism is ancient, right? But it goes to show you that people have struggled with stress and strain for a very, since we've been human, pretty much. Um, and uh, some of the tactics and philosophies to deal with it are, are valid, even, even thousands of years later. All right, so here we go. Just going to get this little clasp, little leather bits, kind of make those show up. See, I'm just getting the edges here. And a little bit of, of texture on the, the body of the bag just to kind of show a little bit of stretch there. I want to hit a little bit lighter at the very edge as if it's a little bit worn. I'm using my highlight color. I'm going to stipple it, I think. Yeah, yeah, sports do the same. Yeah, absolutely, Big Chimpo. Yeah, I was sad I didn't discover tennis earlier in life. I tried it post-college. Very briefly, I had a boyfriend who was into it. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think I could have done that. Like if my school had offered tennis. But my school, my high school was very, um, very rural. And like they had football. <laughs> Pretty much that's it. <laughs> Alrighty. Going to put a little bit of shadow in here too. Kind of keep it a darker leather. But we can see the bag now. It comes out. You can see the details. And that's what you want with a dark leather. You want to be able to see the details, but you don't have to highlight it as high. I don't want this leather to be shiny, so I'm not taking it up any higher than that mid color. Oh, nice. That sounds like your great book. Yeah, because there's like, um, yeah, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, Daniel Kahneman's book is another good one with that kind of those two different um, types of brain work, right? And yeah, it's definitely different parts of your brain. You could read that and apply it to almost anything, I bet. Maybe we need an inner game of painting. Maybe I, maybe I need to write that book, huh? <laughs> maybe that's the mini painting book I need to write. You know, that, that has appealed to me. Yeah, that, that appeals to me. Because you guys know, you guys know how much I'm into 
Um, just the way the brain processes information and, and like, you know, getting past your own inner barriers and, you know, and, and uh, using painting as, as a way to de-stress and relax and, um, and, and yeah, and get in the zone and, you know, being open to learning. Like, that all sounds like it would pretty much be, that book would be the Anne painting book. It's been a very long time. And I will admit that, you know, part of why I never really wrote, like, really considered sitting down and starting my painting book was that, you know, it's, uh, if you if you just talk about painting, it's just like everybody else's painting book, right? With the exception of, like, Kirill's, Kirill's FAQ book. Oh, my God, worth it. That man, because he's got such a great way. And Arnaud's um, fact book, FAQ book, too, is also, they're both, they both explain things differently, but they're such pros and they do things so um, uniquely in a lot of ways that those books, those painting books are really, really, really worth it. Plus, at least in Arnaud's book, he's using a lot of reference models from friends of his, like a lot, a lot of friends. And uh, so you get to see a lot of beautiful minis in there, too, that are kind of talking when he's talking about given uh, um, techniques. So, but I've always felt like, like my painting book, I'd want it to be very Anne. And so I had to stop and I guess I had to spend a lot of time figuring out, you know, what would be, what's my angle, right? What do I, what do I think I could really talk about in the hobby that not a lot of other people talk about? And I feel like the mental barriers thing and the, the fear factor and the, you know, the struggle when you're on a plateau and how you think about painting and, you know, the tips for kind of, you know, like, like the beginner's mind tip for, you know, learning more in your classes, all that kind of stuff. That probably is kind of my, my bailiwick if I were to write, finally, a mini painting book. <laughs> Zen and the art of miniature painting. I know, I know. Oh, that would turn off as, the problem is that would turn off as many people as it turned on. I'd have to think of a catchy title for it. Insert catchy title here. And then I'd have to put it in my, uh, Put it into my production uh, schedule. <laughs> it would take a lot longer than my average fiction book, I bet. I would probably, it would be the kind of thing that I would work on in between projects, right? In between Bear King's books or whatever. It would be that kind of thing where I'd, I'd set, I'd settle down and write a couple chapters and do the photos because doing the photos is the pain in the butt, right? Yeah. Marketing strategy writes itself. Yep. Yeah. Well, I can start brainstorming that. Although today I'm excited. Today I have so many cool things to do. I'm going to send out a newsletter today to my, my author mailing list. And I'm going to ask for ARC readers, which are advanced reader copy people. Um, I've also got, um, for those of you who are who have offered a beta for me, um, I've got, I think I've got five people total now, and that's about what I want. Um, don't worry, I've got your names on an email list. You will get it uh, before. You'll get it quickly, as soon as I'm done with the current round of edits. Um, and then the ARC readers will get it very shortly thereafter, because I want to give you guys enough time to read it. But uh, I do. I would like to like have like 10 reviews on it uh, on launch day. So the ARC is an advanced reader copy team, and essentially you get a free copy of the book in advance um, in exchange for uh, leaving a review. You don't actually have to write one, though of course we do want some written reviews. You could just leave a star rating, but an honest review on the day of release. So it's a cool system that lets um, authors get some reviews on their books like right away. Because the thing is that, you know, launch day is when everybody has a chance to see your book because Amazon's like, oh, it's a fresh new book. Look at this. Um, but if it has no reviews on it, people are going to hesitate, right? So that's why you do ARCs as an author. You get a team that you trust and that is going to follow through and you get, some authors have like a hundred reviews on launch day because their ARC team has gotten so big. That would be really cool and all, but I don't expect that. Not yet. Not yet. We'll give it a few years. Eventually we'll be there. I have faith.
Yes, that's my stuff. And if you're not on my mailing list, you can go to my website down there, A.E. Becker Writes, and you can sign up and you can get a free novella, which if you've read my book, um, then you will probably enjoy because it's uh, a couple of the about about a couple of the characters in the main book uh, in their younger days. If you haven't read my book, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I'm just joking. No judgment. No judgment. I don't want. I don't want every reader. I want the right readers. Um, I have to remind myself of that. I want the readers who are really going to get into the kind of thing I write. <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with you? <laughs> If you like, if you like adventure stories, if you like, if you like Redwall, if you like Redwall, if you like the feel, you know, the cool adventure feel and the like cool characters, you like to root for the characters. Then, uh, and if you like young adult fantasy, it's only young adult really, to be honest, so many adults read young adult these days, but uh, it's only YA because it's got younger protagonists. And technically, this first one is a coming of age. Although a couple of them, a couple of them would fit in the future, would fit that gold, that uh, thing too. But yeah, mold. But yeah. Alrighty, so putting those um, secondary highlights on, we're starting to get, you can see the hand now. It doesn't just disappear. Aw, thanks, Zachariah, thanks. I love world building, so. I can even remember the moment in my, like, tiny childhood where I resolved to always be creative and not copy other people's ideas. Because I tried to write a story, but I mostly wrote it based on, on a story in one of my animal stories books. And I showed it to my mom and she was really proud until I told her that I had taken some of it from the other story. And she was disappointed. And that made a huge like impact on my tiny child brain. And I was like, I am not going to copy anybody else's work again. I'm just going to write my own. I was so determined. So to this day, like I, I've never written fan fiction. Okay, I, ran, I, I, I take that back. World of Warcraft, Blizzard did have a writing contest at one point, so I had to write a WoW fanfic story. What amounts what amounts to a WoW fanfic story? But that's the only time. Uh, otherwise, I put like I try to be creative and original. I try if I'm going to base something, everything is derivative in writing and in in art in general. You're always basing it loosely on something else or got the idea from something else. But I don't write. Um, I try to always create my own worlds. That's part of the fun of it for me now. I think I came to the conclusion on the road with David that the only fanfic I was tempted to write if I ever wrote fanfic was uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse fanfic, the role-playing game from White Wolf. Because I love that game to death. And I could write fanfic based in that world. I like that world a lot. But could I also, like, you know, grab elements of that and make my own werewolf world? Yeah, probably. There we go. Just to edging in a little bit here with eye brown liner to make sure this is ni nice and clean around this uh, hilt. And then we're going to have to um, look up some uh, heraldry. I don't know where my heraldry book went. I used to have a big one. And it's probably around here somewhere. I'm not sure where I stuffed it. It should be on my art bookshelf somewhere. But I may have put it in a different room. But we can always look up um, heraldic stuff online, too. And that will be more useful for most of you. Since everybody's got a internet connection on their 
tiny device that runs their lives. But not everybody has a heraldry book. I got the heraldry books when uh, I was working for, for George R. R. Martin because he loves heraldry and I wanted to put some heraldry on some of the models that he hired me to paint. Yeah, today is uh, today is West of the Moon editing day, and my newsletter, writing my newsletter, which I have, I have a bunch of things I want to put in it. Um, probably a Facebook post, and then uh, editing, and uh, I also want to update East of the Suns file with the actual release date of West of the Moon at the end of it. So I need to re-upload that as well. Just fun stuff. Okay, other people consider it work. I consider it fun stuff. I really liked my PDF that I put out yesterday with the brown pigments. For those of you on my Patreon, uh, the $5 PDF is another pigment one. But I always think it's interesting to delve into things at the pigment level. That's why I'm doing these pigment PDFs a lot now. Because um, it is it is actually kind of useful to know and interesting. There's some interesting factoids. Um, I like doing them because it makes me research some pigments um, that I haven't before. And also it makes me really break down which of my paint lines use which pigments. Where before I might just use, uh, I might, I, I mean, I tend to just use the paint, right? And I learn how it acts by using the paint. And that is the best way to do anything. But it's also kind of cool to learn exactly what pigments are in there, to notice that. Because then you're, you're not only learning how to use that paint, you're also getting a certain level of understanding from what pigment is in that paint. Like, oh, that's why that paint is translucent because it's got this pigment in it and this pigment is uh, a translucent to semi-translucent pigment. You know, so it's like, well, why why doesn't this pigment cover, why doesn't this color cover? It becomes, oh, I understand why this color doesn't cover now because they would have had to add like white to it or something to make it cover and instead they wanted to be a pure pigment. Things like that. I consider it useful. So we're just doing some highlighting on the knuckles here. And, uh, and I was thrilled to realize that uh, the color, the brown that I really like from Chimera, the I call it non-mummy, mummy brown, is actually unique. Like nobody else in miniature painting puts that color out. There's nobody else utilizing that brown. Probably because it's a transparent. And this is where miniatures paints, uh, this is why I think and where the reason for why a lot of... Uh, painters um, do eventually reach for artist colors, right, instead of miniature painting paints, is that because of the, um, the focus on coverage in miniatures paints, some pigments just aren't used, right? So if you're looking for a different effect or you're looking for a good glazable color that's intense, you're reaching for other pigments and, and they may be pigments that are not otherwise present in miniatures paints. And that's the case with Royal Brown from Chimera. It's a pigment that's not used, as far as I could tell, anywhere else because it's a transparent, but it's also an amazing color. I was trying to explain this to David yesterday because David David always is one of those people. He, he wants to go for coverage, and I'm like, yes, but this is why you don't get as good blends as I do, right? And, and I showed him the color. I was like, this is a color that you want to be transparent because its transparency helps with how vibrant it is, and it makes it glazable and that's where I want a really I want a really intense color to be to make a good glaze to really pop out yeah I mean it's it's his style and so David's style comes as comes out you know as very painterly right it's got a lot of brushwork in it which is really cool and it's a very unique style for him right it's not that he can't blend it's just that he's challenged to because he's using thicker paint. So he almost always will have to do spot wet blends, right? Which is not a downside, it's just the way he paints. 
Um, whereas I'll go with layering and glazing because I understand those techniques and those are my bread and butter techniques. I use a lot of spot web blends now, but usually when I'm trying to work fast. I put together two more Tyranids. I'm going to prime them today. I didn't get any painting done last night because I was trying to keep my body from falling apart after the workout. Yeah, you come from brushstroke chip, yeah? And there's nothing wrong with that. You can do it. All right, so we've got just that nice bit of... And if I get too blocky and I can see my brushstrokes, and if it bothers me that I can, I'm going to grab a bit of my russet brown, mix it with a little bit of the brown liner, because remember, brown liner is transparent. Uh, make kind of this coffee color right here. Make a glaze out of it. And just paint that over the top to kind of smooth things together. We made it there and we took it down just a notch. But a glaze is gonna dry pretty much transparent. Make sure not to let it pull, pull off any excess. You'll still get your highlight. It'll just blend in a little bit better. There, that blends in a little bit better. It's not as crazy. Um, Slayer, uh, if I'm doing regular miniatures, I prefer the Zappa Gap uh, Medium, CA+. It's a gap filler. It's not super runny and it's not super, um, super jelly. I also use the uh, uh, Loctite. Um, if I need a gel, then I use the Loctite brand. Um, and if I'm doing, you know, I really like the Tester's plastic, plastic Cement, but this last time I tried the Tamaya or Tamiya, however you say it, um, which is which has a brush inside of a bottle. It's great because you can get really precise results with it. Like you can, I can see why, why heavy, like pro modelers use it because you can really get like those tiny little contact surfaces. You can just get a real thin film of glue. It's really nice, but it reeks because you're opening the bottle every time and the solvent smell is just terrible. It's just terrible. I hate, I hate the smell. I, I can only use it when we've got the back window of the hobby room open and the fan going like, cause it's just so much fumes, so much fumes, so fumes. Much stinky. And I don't like that, so I'm gonna do this over on this glove, but I think I'm gonna highlight it one more time. Yeah, even more toxic, yep. Yeah, I figured it smells toxic. So that's the problem. So I'm kind of thinking about ordering the testers again, which has got the long needle applicator. Much as those needle applicators can also give you, give trouble, um, I like that I liked the testers one when I used it. Now the testers is gone, so of course I have to find something else that's similar. So I may end up going for the stupid GW plastic cement, which is fine. It's just their needle applicators tend to like pull out of the bottle and it's annoying to me. Plus expensive. So I still haven't found a great plastic cement, I guess, to summarize. Yeah, it Testers is well, Testers is kind of it was bought out, right? So now it's different. It's not um it's not um their uh dull coat anymore. But yeah, if the new mat is good, that's good to know. Yeah, I mean, as long as your glue works, it doesn't matter. If you're using, I mean, just the bottom line is use super glue when you're doing miniatures. In general. I've never used Uhu, so I don't know, but. No. I don't know. The, um, the Tamiya, let me grab it. Hold on, I'll grab my bottle. I don't know if it's a quick setting version. One second. It, 
appears to be the extra thin. This is the one I got. Danger, extremely flammable, vapor harmful. Yes, not good. So there is a... Okay, so extra thin is the regular version. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's just I can tell that it's bad to breathe, right? So I always hold my breath when I'm using it and recap it super fast to make sure I'm using it in a room with the fan going. But I hate having to do that. Like with the long needle applicators, I never have to worry about that, right? I've just put it onto the model and, and do it. Ah, okay. I see. So Uhu was the answer for that particular Dungeons, Dungeons and Laser stuff. That's good to know, Agent Marvel. I don't know, Pendrake, but te testers went out of business and got bought by, by, I forget who bought them. One of the big ones. Krylon, was it? But testers' problem is they just didn't understand their market. They didn't understand how their market had changed. And so they made some bad decisions and lost money and got bought. And which is a shame because Dull Coat was my go-to um, spray lacquer for a long time. Long time. I still have a couple of cans of it. The new matte is not as matte. Alrighty. Let's see if I have to re-highlight anywhere here on the leather, but I think it's showing up pretty well. It's still dark, but it's leading as a nice lead, uh, it's uh, reading as a nice rich leather brown right now. And there and there. So that's good. All right, now time to mess up our blending. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you'd have to Google that one, Pendrake. I don't remember on the testers thing. I just remember uh, everybody was like, get your dull coat now. It's They're going out of business. Oh, maybe Rust-Oleum bought testers. Rust-Oleum. Oh, there we go. Zachariah with the answer. But yeah, I mean, testers just did not get it. Like when they brought out a miniatures line of paints, do you guys remember that? They brought them out in the same glass bottles with the stupid metal tops that are, not only is it a paint pot, it's a terrible paint pot that freezes shut on you and you can't open it. Um, you know, it's just, they, they just didn't understand. Right. Yeah. And all the G, all the modern GW stuff fits really well. So yeah, that's what I've been using is the, the cameo. Yeah, I know, right? And But why should we need to do that? Like, testers just did not... They understood that miniatures painters really liked their stuff, and they understood that that was a market, but they did not understand how to appeal to that market. They did not do... As far as I can tell, nobody did any product research in that company. If they... Or if they if they did, they, they like, pretty much said, oh, well, our stuff is different, and it'll sell more because it's different, which is the worst ever rationale. Things don't sell because they're different. Things sell because they're familiar, but better. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, but it's true. True even in books. Familiar, but different. Familiar, but better. So they should have done regular bottles, the kind of where the industry is used to, either droppers or pots. But they just didn't. They just didn't understand it. Like they, you could tell, you could, because I was following it. Because I, you know, when I worked at Reaper, and even now, I try to follow all new paint lines. Like I, I try to try one. You know, I pick up a bottle, I analyze it the way I do to figure out what they're doing, and then, um, you know, I come to conclusion over whether it's something that I would personally like or use, or recommend, right? So I can talk intelligently about the paint line. That's why I bought one of the so flat paints, right? Which I actually did feature in my PDF yesterday, by the way. You can see the pigment number right there. PBR7. Good old PBR7. The most commonly used brown oxide in the world. <clears throat> yeah. Plus you really had to use, you really wanted to use like padded pliers, right? So you wouldn't like, otherwise it's just nasty and you can skid. Yeah. 
It's just bad. It's bad stuff. Feels bad, man. All right, let's look for a nice, um, let's see. I don't know, heraldry. This is where I, sh where I really wanted to do some looking. I'm just looking. Oh, see, I used to, I have this book somewhere. I have this book somewhere. The problem with it is just that the, most of the um, designs are too, uh, it's too complex, right? But uh, we can look at some basic, basic designs and basic ways of like breaking up shields. That's pretty cool. So we already have a quartered shield. Um, so if I'm gonna do a design on it, I don't really want to do a cross on her though. Kind of just scanning to kind of look for some inspiration. That comet is cool. I like the comet, the star with the tail. That would work on this shield really well. Even, especially if I gave it a triple tail. Like two small tails coming out. What do you guys think of the comet? I kind of like the comet. I think that's a pretty cool, um, that's a pretty cool thing, that one. Oh, yep, bye hamster. Have fun. Doesn't work, haha, -ha. Quindy, Quindy turned it off. Yeah, I think I like that one. I think I like that, I'm gonna adapt this. So the star will fit in one quarter and then I can have the tail coming out into all three other quarters. Oh no, oh no, no, it's on! Quindy, Quindy, help! <laughs> Quindy! <laughs> oh no. All right, star in one quarter, got it, let's go. Let's go. Well, that's because the GW uses the arc, right? Like it's, it's, but I like the wiggly tail actually. And we can change it up a little bit and not make it so smooth. Always, I mean, when you're looking for a design, you're really just trying to find something that works for you and then you're changing it we all know how to paint a star right use thin paint and then adjust a little bit because our stars are always lopsided nobody ever does a perfect star out the gate and if they do we don't like them very much <laughs> See, I've got a little bit of a lopsided star, so I'm gonna correct it a little bit. But now that I've got something down, I can correct it. There we go, good job, Quindy. Wouldn't it be quarterly black and blue with silver, Comet? Yeah. Because the blue is the color. Blue and black technically are the colors. And I don't have a proper heraldry here very much. Although there are other heraldic devices that are black and silver, so I guess I am. I guess black does count as a color. There was a Reaper Live, I see. Let's 
Sometimes I can draw a pretty good star, but this one is a little lopsided, so I'm just going to correct it a little bit. You can usually tell, you know, which fins are short. That's why I'm using thinned paint, so I can easily correct without adding a lot of globulence. Ah. That's Reaper. Irregular Reaper. Highly irregular. Instead of trying to shorten these arms, I think I'm going to lengthen these other arms. That's close. go we're getting there so just real light touches I'm just trying to shape it a little nicer that's getting there I'm gonna fill that in yeah Except that I bet a lot of that blue back in those days faded out to be more of a blue-gray. More like this uh, heraldic blue that I'm, which is very close to what I'm actually using on the model. Because light fastness, right? Not a lot of colors were very light fast back in those days. A lot of fugitive, fugitive dyes and pigments. go and then I've got I'm gonna have essentially a split here and it's gonna be all one at first and down here it's going to go and I make I'll make it a little ragged Yeah, it would have to. I figured out that black had to count as a color in British heraldry because uh, there are black and white heraldic uh, coats of arms. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'd probably call this sky blue, sky blue. And again, I'm using really thinned white. It's thinned about two to one. Because I want to be able to do... kind of sketch it on, right? And then we'll make sure we get this linked up. So I'm definitely taking the uh, design and changing it, making it more a little more elaborate. And 
It almost looks like a bird, which actually I like. I like this. I like this design. Yeah, it looks kind of cool. I like how they look like wings and it looks like a tail. It's almost like a star-headed bird. I like that. Now we'll fill it in. And we'll again, I'll fill it in with thinned paint and I'll just build up layers, makes it easy to correct if I blorf. So after West of the Moon launches, I may set up, a, set up a separate Discord for my writing. I'd like to be able to engage with my community and give news and stuff, even to people who aren't on my newsletter or who aren't on Facebook, which is a lot of younger readers too. Yeah, with the triple comment, the triple tailed comment order. It's pretty cool. Hook this one a little bit more. I think I've decided I want to base my Tyranids on snow bases, but with industrial underpinning. So I ordered some Games Workshop Necromunda bases that I can use to create some stamps for Green Stuff and Putty um, to to create my own bases quickly without having to do a lot of um, to buy a lot of pre-made bases. Yeah. Yeah, the Necromunda bases were cool because although they come only in smaller sizes, 28 and 32, I think, um, they are, uh, the, the sculpts are a little better than some of the other GW bases. Uh, and they're cheap because Necromunda isn't as popular as 40K. So I actually got the pack of each for like eight bucks. And I should be able to use those to make variations that are that fit on larger bases. All right, so that's coming along. I'm gonna thicken up my white just a little now that I've got this more or less sketched out. So I'm gonna make that fin a little bit bigger. There. Yeah, 
and I'm painting right up to the border on the blue, right up to the panel, but I'm leaving the black as a separator, which makes sense. All right, so now I want the paint, the paint a little thicker so I can solidify that. Oh, cerulean. Yeah, I think you're right, Pendrick. That makes sense. Like black, you could go either way with it, right? Yeah, I think David is kind of looking, he, David is kind of giving me the side eye lately about the Tyranids. <laughs> like he doesn't believe that I'm going to paint an army, but I'm kind of in the mood. So we'll see. We'll see how far it goes. I did decide because I think there's only 20 termagants in my box. I think there's only 20. Maybe there's more. But um, I did decide that every three, I think, every three termagants, I was going to let myself paint a bigger model because there are quite a few bigger models in this box. And every three plus and then do a big model is kind of fun. Like that's, I don't have to paint many, many little bugs at all to do that. So, and three is, three is the like, a, for me and not being an army painter, painting three, three of the base models at a time is, it, it's more or less right. I can finish three models in a decent, decently short period and then I can work on a big pretty one <sighs> yep yep yeah I used to know it better too when I first started painting for Graham Pendrake for that reason I studied it a little bit more I always thought it was fun Got, I've added one drop of pure white to my mix and I did not add any extra water. Um, because five is too many for me, Pendrake, I'll get, I'll get bored. Though the termagants are really cute. Okay, if you're me, they're cute. Because David was like, well, you don't have to paint all the little ones. And I'm like, but they're the cutest ones. <laughs> he, that's why I say he's been giving me the side eye. He's like, who is this woman and why did I marry her? Because <laughs> I'm excited about my bugs. Out of all of the armies that I have started and not finished, Tyranids were the one that I actually got furthest on. Except for my Wood Elves. I guess my Wood Elves because I really liked the Wood Elves. So I liked their aesthetic, I liked my idea, and I was playing a lot. But Tyranids were my, 40, as far as 40K armies, definitely the only one that I, that I liked enough to paint a lot of. So I just feel like, I feel like painting an army, what can I say? The point is not to finish on this, Pendrake. I'm not going into it. And I think that's why I'm feeling so relaxed about it and why I'm enjoying it is I am not trying to finish the army. When I have enough models, I will try, try to find somebody to play with me so I can learn, relearn the game. Um, but I don't have a time. I'm not putting a time limit on it. I'm actually just really enjoying it. And I want to continue enjoying it because armies can feel like a real slog, but I really like these models and I do want them. Even my mooks are going to be painted to a, a decent standard. So, and the big models will be painted to a, a really good standard. depending on how much, you know, how much I'm enjoying the process. But, um, but yeah, the point on this one, I figured it out, is like the journey is the most important part of it for me. It gives me something fun, models that I really enjoy that are different from anything that I paint, you know, on stream or elsewise. Um, 
and they're pretty simple once you get the wash on them and just start the detailing. So they're, it's kind of a nice exercise in completing without, if I hold myself to completing five, it's gonna feel more like a slog and that's what I'm trying to avoid. Yeah, cool, I'm glad you like it, Shadow Raven. I like it too. Fills the space nicely and it's cool. I think I want my comet to go a little bit more curvy here. But yeah, I think with this, like, do I want to play eventually? Yeah. Will this game be around for a while? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's no hurry, really. Um, and I like, I, I'm doing a lot of other things in my life. Other, A lot of other things in my life right now are to deadline, right? There is a rush. There is a must get it done, right? The Patreon every month, um, the book you know, the books and their release schedule. Uh, and so for me, for this, I think the goal is to paint myself a Tyranid force that I really like, that I really enjoyed painting, that I think look cool. And finishing, quote unquote, the army is not a major goal. I mean, eventually, the thing about armies is that you can keep going, right? There is no finish. Um, there's just a certain number of points that you might have or not. Yeah, almost like a holy symbol, yep. Yeah, well, and you can always just aim for 500 points at first, right? And 500 points is pretty easy. But, but I don't have, I mean, we used to play some of my fondest 40k and gaming miniatures gaming memories are when my friends and I back in Madison would get together and we would we would split into teams and do 10,000 points to a side so like that's why I say there is no there is no end right there is no there is no end to an army even if the standard tournament amount is 2,000 points you still want other units and more of x or y so that you can play different configurations so I always thought that four or 5,000 points was about right because then you've got options. So that's going to take me forever to paint, forever. So I'm not even looking at that. I'm not even looking at it. Instead, I'm like three little bugs, one big bug, three little bugs, one big bug, three little bugs, one big bug. <laughs> uh, because there's actually, it's sculpted that way and I decided I liked that look. I didn't want to just like do it. I kind of like the breakup and I know it's different, but these, um, the panels on this shield, Pendrake, they're actually offset. Like the blue ones are actually raised and the black ones are actually sunk. So for this particular weird shield, I decided to keep the lines. I kind of like it. Kind of like the look. You still see the symbol. So. Oh, it'll be a while before I get a bio Titan. That would be like, that would be like random user because they're so expensive. That sort of thing, I would be like, if I finish 2,000 points, then I can reward myself with a really cool giant Tyranid model, right? You know I already have one, right? I don't, I don't have a Bio Titan, but I have a Forge World Tyranid. It was actually the first, I've showed you guys this before, but I'll show you again. Let me unhook Widowmaker. I've got a Widowmaker attached to my Tyranid right now. She hangs off of, she hangs off of his claw. <laughs> I'm splitting I'm I'm because her little anchor, her little uh her grapple actually fits nicely around his claw and then she can hang off my painting desk. Hold on, let me un unwind her. Okay, widow, over here. You're you've been nerfed anyway. Ah. Yeah, there's deep grooves. So this is Forge World. Um obviously I tried to paint it once before and I decided I didn't like the color, so I just like sprayed over it i'm just gonna paint over it um but you can see the beautiful like fine detailing and the skin and everything this is this is definitely their porcelain resin it's not their gaming resin um it's just a really nice hormigon hormigons don't exist anymore but he's still cool but yeah so this is a one of a kind at this point i cannot get this model anymore it doesn't it is not made it has not they went away from statues and toward gaming models so he's coming up underneath, out of the floor, which I just love. It's an aliens kind of thing. Aliens vibe for sure. Um, but yeah, so 
I do have one big Forge World tier nid, and I still have to paint him. But now that I have my color scheme, I can paint him in my color scheme for my army. Like, now I can finally finish this model. Can't enter it anywhere, because it's, like, ancient and out of print. Well, I could, I could enter it at ReaperCon. ReaperCon doesn't care. It's the nice thing about ReaperCon. Okay, okay, Widow. Gotta get you back up here. Let's grapple the Tyranid paw again. <laughs> I love that her grapple actually like will work. It'll wrap around things. It's fantastic. These toys, they're not cheap, but I like this one a lot. It had it had a lot of potential. There we go. Okay, cool. Back up top. She's gotta guard guard my play space, my paint space. There we go. But yeah, now I can actually um, base coat that guy in my, because I really like my new color scheme. All right, there we go. Hang there, widow. Perfect. Okay, so porcelain resin is like, just like regular resin. It's just like the harder glass-like, you know, um, has, has, it's, it's the same it's like this, right? Except it's not true porcelain. It's got um, polymers mixed in that make it a little softer. But it's still a really hard, brittle resin, and that's why they've gone away from it. Um, but it gives you that incredible fine detail. There's really, you just do the same thing you do with any resin slayer. You want to wash it, um, you know, in soapy, warm water, and then you want to prime it. You always want to prime it. So, but yeah, so it is primed. So all I have to do really is like start to put paint on him. But otherwise it's just, uh, it's fragile. So just, you gotta be careful not to break off the little bits and uh... all right, it's almost solid. I've still got a little bit, I can see little bits of uh, base through it. We're almost done with the paint, with the, uh, with the show. So it's good. I hear a Kiki. Kiki, are you going to come in? Are you going to come in? You want to come in and say hi? No, Kiki says I'm going to flop down over here. Oomph. Kiki's being like shy today. But yeah, they've gone more to a plasticky type resin for Forge World stuff because it's just not as fragile. And I, I don't blame them. Um, but the statues in the olden days were done with that porcelain resin that was really... Uh, I felt that it was nice to work with if you could keep it away from breakage. But the new resin's good too. Yeah, so it takes a while to fill in when you use thin paint, but you also get a much smoother result than you would if you use thick paint. Oh, Kiki's just like wandering around going, hey, is it time for our walk yet? Hey, hey. I closed the door so she couldn't like hit the screen when the birds were interesting. Actually, she likes when we get a mouse. When a mouse shows up, she wants to go chase it. And of course, if I blorfed at any time um, in a big bad way, I would just grab my black or I'd grab my blue and I would just kind of sketch it in from the opposite direction. Oh, paint club. Nice. Wow, lots of paint club. Awesome. You were running a lot of paint club. That's fantastic. Yay for paint club. More paint club. Lots more paint club than I could do. Just a little bit more down here. But yeah, once I get um, more bugs uh, done, I'll show you guys. I have to try a couple more uh, different levels of washes. So I, I do like how the first one turned out with a darker wash than I was originally thinking, but I kind of like to do a lighter version too. I think my leader models are all going to be quite light because I'm not going to do washes on those. I'm going to do layering. 
So the big bugs are going to be lighter in color and the small, the small bugs are going to be darker. But I'm going to paint the hive tyrant uh, after these three, the winged hive tyrant. All right. Cool, Quindy. Three times a week to keep yourself productive and because people set different schedules. Good. Excellent. Yeah, and I don't think we need, like, I think that's enough. Like, I could do something small down here, but I'd have to think about what I'd want to do. Like, if I did anything, it would probably be with the star with the three tails. But I don't know that I really want to. I, I like the texture that I've got on this white where it looks kind of rough and heavy, which it should if she's in the winter. So I just don't feel, I'm not, I might, and I don't want to just put stars, right? I could maybe do a little bit of a comet curl at these corners. But I don't think I want to really do anything big in the white. I think maybe our focus now is going to be building her base. Something, uh, just giving her like a rock to stand on and snow. I think we'll keep it simple. I am not in the loop, Pendrick, but um, if they are doing what Ed had originally discussed and I had originally discussed, um, it was... We were actually gonna though there's gonna be a lot of a lot of like change. A lot of change. Yeah. I'm expecting a lot of changes with uh, MS if if they're gonna revise MSP. I would advise you, all of you, to grab the paints you like as much as you can. Now while you can. No, I don't know. I See, the thing is, I don't know, Pendrake, and it's very easy when talking about stuff like this to start a panic. But if I were you, guys, if there is a weird paint that, that you probably internally understand probably doesn't sell a lot, I would pick it up because because one of the things that could be coming along is a, is a major line revamp where we lose a lot of colors that aren't moving. And so that could be, I don't know, could, maybe not, but yes, you always can. This is true. Cause they'll just essentially, they'll do a small batch and then they'll sample the rest. And that's fair. Like to price it higher. But still, if you don't want to spend that 50 bucks or have to dig up friends to do that 50 bucks. See, and if they mention that, then I'm right. And there's going to be a big load of cancellations. So order now. Yeah, like I'm going to put it, that just, that just spurs me more. I need to go and put in an order for, uh, for the paints I need for my army. <laughs> Cause yeah, I don't want to have to like mix some of these from scratch. <laughs> I'm going to have to get a lot of Moonstone Blue, a lot, and a lot of Night Sky Indigo. Um, yeah, one friend cuts it to 25. It's not an exorbitant price. Five bucks a bottle for a custom order is not bad, guys. That's not bad. But it's even better if you can order it at the regular price now. <laughs> And honestly, what we found, I, I would not surprise me at all if we found a very vanishingly few people have done the special order, right? Yeah. So I'm just saying big changes, get the colors you love. I mean, if you honestly, if enough people order the colors we love, then maybe they won't get taken out. You never know. Right. Or they'll get brought back. Um, but yeah, I need to order. I need to order some stuff. I definitely, I definitely want my army colors, that's for sure. But yeah, so, and I don't, like I said, I don't know for sure. But especially if they mentioned that whole you can always order a custom batch thing, then I would say there's going to be cancels. 
because the line is so big. It's so big and unwieldy and it takes up a ton of space. That was kind of my, um, my original suggestion, Zachariah, was, was now that we have all these colors, back in, back in the day, back in the day when I talked about this to Ron and Ed, I think, man, it was way a long time ago though, I said that if they wanted to do that, I wanted the opportunity to rework the lines so that they made sense. Like all the reds together, all the oranges together, all the yellows together, that kind of thing, right? Because that's the, hey, Balrog, we're about to, we're about to end the stream, but good morning. Um, uh, because that's like the kind of thing I would like to do re in retro, right? It would be to combine the lines um, and stuff. Yeah, order Moth Green. She's coming. Queen, Quinny's coming for you. They absolutely, um, XI Delta, they perform very, very differently. To a point. Okay, so here's the deal. What level of a painter are you? If you are not doing really fine detailing um, and you're not layering essentially to try to get smooth blends or to create textures, you can do a lot with synthetic brushes. And even if you are doing some of that stuff, synthetic brushes will do it um, better than they used to if you get a good one. But the, here's the thing, right? You've got to get a good synthetic. Um, and uh, the synthetic brush will curl. It'll have that curl at the tip. It'll break down. It'll be development. <laughs> Agent Marvel. I just have to order another 12 bottles. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so natural hair brushes do not curl. Um, they just wear, like you'll slowly lose hairs and they'll, they'll wear thinner and thinner, but you can still make them come to a perfect point even years later. Um, they are more expensive. So it, make sure you take care of your brushes, Delta, if you're going to invest in like a, a Winsor Newton Series 7 or a Da Vinci Maestro or any of the brushes that I use, right? But I mean, let's find one of my, one of my, um, here's one that I've used for a long time. So I think I used this Da Vinci Maestro for at least a year. It's a little bit, got its tip a little bit pointed, but, but it still comes to that, that kind of point. Like, it's so old that its little sticker is, like, totally, like, <laughs> I've, I've, like, accidentally peeled it off slowly over using it. But it still comes to that kind of point. Um, whereas a synthetic brush will, here's a very good, here's a good synthetic. Let me see how good of a point I can make it go to. So if I flatten it, I can make it go to a pretty good point. But the synthetic, I only used a few times. You can see the curl starting right there at the tip. Now... They both have good tips. So you can do fine detail, eyeballs, all that kind of thing. Um, staple brushes are not more rigid or firm, actually. The synthetic is actually more rigid. The staple brushes have uh, have a snap to them, and but they are softer overall. But they're shaped very well, and they're not going to do that, that curl thing. Like, there's actually, you can almost see it, a little fuzziness at the tip of this brush. That's because synthetic hairs are plastic. So that as they abrade, as you move them over the surface, you're going to get that fuzziness to the tip. So what, what happens is that you'll go through more of these synthetic brushes. Like you'll, you'll use it for a little bit and then it'll slowly bust out and you won't be able to do eyeballs with it anymore. And then you'll put it aside and reach for a fresh one. Or some people will just keep a synthetic that they specifically use for very fine details and only for that. And then they paint regularly with the rest. Yeah, a lot of people will use uh, synthetics for just base coating, and then when they have to do detail, they'll reach for a natural hairbrush. No, uh, Balrog, there's no copyright on a formula. That's not a correct word, but it is proprietary information, and we will not give you the formula. Um, that's, that's Reaper proprietary information. Proprietary is the correct word. Now, that said... I have been known to tell you guys how to mix colors that are out of print. Like if you want garnet red, mix half and half deep red and blood red. But I'm not giving you a formula. I'm not giving you pigment ratios on it. I'm not telling you what pigments are in it. I won't do that. That's, that's against the Reaper rules. I mean, okay, so here's the deal, Delta. Use it. But always rinse really well. Like when you feel your paint getting sticky, make sure to rinse your brush. If you develop a frequent rinsing habit, you're going to be just fine. 
and don't ever leave it <clears throat> don't ever leave it sitting in the paint water jar ever ever or i'll come to your house <laughs> not for a good thing either <laughs> but if you want them to last those are your two rules if you really want natural hair brushes to last rinse frequently and reload rather than always just dipping the brush back in the paint again and again and again when you do that the paint works its way up to the ferrule more often and can uh, lodge there and dry there and then you have to use brush cleaner um but uh, rinse often and reload rather than just repetitively dipping in the paint. When you notice the paint is a little tacky when you're brushing it, just rinse and reload. Um, and never, ever leave it in the paint jar, the paint water jar nose down. Just rinse it and bring it out. Yeah, I have a, I have a thing about brushes on my um, Fundamentals of Mini Painting uh, YouTube thing. But it's more about the different brushes. So if you wanted to, Delta, you could go over there. I'm on YouTube as Painting Big. Uh, two words, I think. Um, they're actually, it's the... Where's my YouTube? Oh, no, no. Okay, so it's the third line up from the bottom um, with the word Instagram after it. That's my YouTube channel. I have a Fundamentals of Mini Painting uh, series for the basics. Um, I'm not quite done with it, but I have brushes on there. So I talk about the different types of brushes, what they're good at, what the differences are. Um, in detail, more detail than I can do here. Yeah. Yes. Give me more YouTube hours. Alrighty. But yeah, so, but that's the dealio. Just don't, you know, don't treat, these are, these are, these are good brushes. They'll take a hit. Um, and keep on ticking as long as you rinse them nicely and you rinse them frequently and you, and you uh, don't leave them sitting in paint water. You don't even really have to use a brush care conditioner on them. You can, if you want. Um, hair, regular old hair conditioner works great if you want to shape it, you know, at the end of painting, if you want to put a little conditioner in them and shape them into a nice point and leave them sit, then you're great. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not familiar with monuments, so I don't know how good they are. Um, there are different grades of sable. So, you know, uh, if you paid 20 though, you probably paid for Kalinsky. Kalinsky is the word you want. It's the two highest grades of red sable are termed Kalinsky. And these are the brushes that wear well, last for years if you take decent care of them, um, and uh, are usually the highest priced and also hand built to hold the best point. That's what you're paying for. You're paying for the high quality of the hair and the extra care in building the brush so that it holds a good point. Yeah, I use my Reaper here. I've been using my Reaper Zero here and there on stream. I used to use the Reaper uh, Zero Slash Five, Zero, um, the Ot Five size and the black handle. If it's a red handle, it's a synthetic reaper. If it's a black handle, it's a... Yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> I still work for Reaper. Um, it's been 20 years. 20 years working for Reaper. But uh, yeah. You, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, this is Reaper's channel. So uh, I paint Reaper figures on here. And uh, on occasion, I use Reaper brushes. But I also use my, my beloved Da Vinci's and uh, Windsor Newton and uh, Raphael. So, but yeah, things like this, like we just did this freehand, like that's really having a, having a sable brush for that is very good because that you want that tip that'll help you do really precise stuff. Um, another tip, Delta, use thinned paint with that new brush of yours. Uh, sables work better if you thin your paint a little. I, again, I asked what level you're at. I don't know what you are, if you're a beginner, if you're intermediate, if, you, if you've been around the block. Um, but uh, definitely thin paint works better with the uh, sable because it'll come off of that thin brush a lot easier. And again, I talk about this um, in my uh, fundamentals videos. So if you watch them, if you watch them all, <laughs> then you'll get it. Okay, still, still new. Yeah, cool. Well, welcome to the hobby. It's, fu it's a fun, fantastic hobby and it's super relaxing. Um, and yeah, good job. Welcome. Cool. Well, here I do paint to a pretty high standard, but I also um, ask, I answer a lot of questions. I'm always willing to stop and ask, answer questions as you are asking. Um, we do a rotation of models. We, we work on a different model every day and I'm always on uh, USA Central Time 1130 to one. So we're actually at the end of the stream, right? We've gone a little bit over, but that's okay. But yeah, so cool. So uh, Monday, guys, when we are back, speaking of doing it every day, we will be back on Mr. Elf. Back on Angry Link, as, uh, as Quindy calls him. We just were doing the reddish leather. I'm really liking how the colors are shaping up on this model. So we decided to use muted greens on this one, as opposed to our other elf that we're usually, uh, we're using pretty saturated greens. So, 
So yeah, so we're going to be working on more on this guy. I really like him. I like how he's coming along. Still thinking, still thinking about pale hair, about like an off-white hair color for him. Ah, uh, let me think. Saturday, I've got, I've got CrossFit in the morning. <laughs> Making up session. Um, probably, probably yes. Thanks for the reminder, Quindy. So I do have my own Twitch, my own uh, Twitch channel, which is Twitch.tv/paintingbig, uh, and I will likely be. We've still got to finish. We've still got to finish the parquet floor on this model. So I haven't, I haven't worked on it. So we've got to finish doing the, the wood grain, um, stuff. So yeah, uh, if you give my, my Twitch a follow, hopefully Twitch will think about notifying you at some point, um, when I'm on, but I only do Saturdays and I'm on about 3.30 USA Central time and we do about an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. Um, yeah, she's, she's really, I really like her now, Agent Marvel. I really like her a lot. So yeah, all I've got to do now is the floor and uh, we are we are good to go to give her to Andy at ReaperCon. So yeah, so just got to gotta get that wood grain more defined, but not too much because I, I want it in there and I want it not to look messy because right now it's just sketched. You can tell that I've just done very sketchy work on it. But uh, I want to tighten it up, but not too much because of course we want the main focus to be looking at her and not the wood grain. That's the challenge, right? I might have to do some dark glazes over it at the end just to bring it down a little bit, but we shall see. But anyway, that's what we're working on on Saturday. And uh, if I get done with that, maybe, or I, uh, then I'll maybe I'll work on my tear nids. <laughs> yeah, so cool. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Tune on in on a Monday for working on Melanie, our, our, um, our moody elf dude. Uh, and yeah, Oh, wow. Reaperland should maybe possibly be on tonight if the stars align. Yeah, I like Tyranids. I cannot lie. They were my first real 40k army and I'm back on them now that the new ones are coming out. All right. Yeah, you, the rest of you, if I don't see you tomorrow, then have a fantastic weekend. I'm looking forward to this weekend. Now that we've, we're back from vacation, I feel like I need a second vacation. <laughs> so yes. Thank you, everybody. I will see you around wherever I see you. Okay, take care.